So I'm really excited to be here to uh, visit Google and have a chance to tell you a little bit about relevance feedback. Um, I understand, I know quite a few of you I know, a lot of people I don't know though, and I think a, a lot of you may not be as familiar with the field of information retrieval. So I want to tell you a little bit about that, but also tell you about some of the work I've been doing. And you, but all this work is really about relevance feedback. And what relevance feedback has been used for traditionally is to get to know your user a little bit better. Um, it's been used in single session, so just for one particular query, but also over the long term. So those are the things that I want to tell you about today. Um, David gave a really great introduction, uh, I think, but I also wanted to just tell you a little bit about my background. So I am in the School of Information and Library Science, and some of you may say, wow, that's kind of weird. Um, but it is the case that people who study IR problems uh, historically have been either in computer science schools or in um, information and library science schools. And the reason for that, of course, is you can imagine that libraries had lots and lots of information a long time ago uh, that needed to be organized. And so they sort of lent themselves as nice institutions, places that had problems, retrieval problems, um, to begin with. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. I also have studied a lot uh, in psychology and cognitive science. And so I sort of have a, a behavioral science perspective on things as well. Uh, I mentioned before a little bit of what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, <clears throat> what I really want to focus mostly on is, again, sort of giving you an overview of some of the research that's been done in IR in relevance feedback. And I'm not going to have tons of references in this PowerPoint presentation just to keep the clutter down. But I will go back and add some references to this presentation. And I'm assuming this presentation will probably be available to you. So if you did want to go back and read a little bit more about any of the, the stuff that I'm going to tell you about today, you'll be able to, to use this as a reference. So that's one of my big goals. The other thing that I really wanted to, to tell you a little bit more about is the use of um, it, what's called implicit feedback. And so I know a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of you probably are dealing with log data, looking at signals you get in log data, for instance, um, people's click-through behaviors and things like that. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some research that I did that looked at that from sort of the other side of the fence, that is from the user side of the fence, so that you can get a little bit of an idea about how complicated these signals um, actually are and, and sort of get a little bit more uh, information about the context in which these signals are orig uh, originating. Uh, to set the stage here, I wanted to make a few distinctions between um, IR, uh, classic IR, and web IR. So if you know, if you've been in the field of, of classic IR, by what I mean by that is sort of this text retrieval conference model of IR, the more academic kind of version of IR where you know, we have test collections that often consist of newspaper documents and we're doing experiments on those kinds of things versus web IR, which is what probably most of you are familiar with, where you have lots of other kinds of information that you're dealing with. The scenario is a little bit different. So first, a lot of what I'm saying is work that I've done more in the classic IR area. So think about that when I tell you this stuff. Not all of it is directly applicable to the web just because it's a different situation, but I think some of it probably might be useful for you and at least useful for you thinking about ways you can adapt it to the web environment, the environment that you're working in. Um, classic IR users typically have been, of course, you know, library patrons. Uh, when IR first started, the, the big task or user model was a person who was looking for documents about a particular topic, more recall-based topic more recall-based searching, where you want to find a whole bunch of references about a particular topic. Not something like a high-precision task, which I think a lot of you uh, probably deal with and a lot of web users deal with, where you're looking for one a small number of pieces of information, one correct answer, navigation task, those kinds of things. So traditionally, people in IR, this classic IR, have studied different kind of tasks. But of course, with web IR and with web searching in general, people are starting to work on more and more different kinds of tasks, not just this sort of classic task where it's very exhaustive kinds of searching. Um, a lot of stuff that I'll tell you about sort of looks at both areas. But again, just think about these two different kinds of users and these two different kinds of tasks um, that exist. So relevance feedback is actually kind of exciting because I think, and this is sort of me making a statement here, but I'm pretty sure, and I, I ran this by David, and he says, yeah, I think that's true. But I think that relevance feedback actually was the first interactive IR technique ever. 
Um, systems in IR used to be ran in batch mode, and even the librarian who would be doing searching on behalf of some patron would actually, you know, formulate the query for the patron, submit the queries in batch mode because these are these old systems where you time shared systems, systems where you had to pay a lot of money to do uh, retrieval and things like that. So there was no interaction between the user and the actual information or the system. It was all mediated by a librarian. Then over time, of course, uh, when more and more people started using the system, and even librarians, researchers said, hey, let's try to get some more information from people when they're searching. Instead of just looking at these queries, let's actually try to engage in some kind of interaction, some sort of feedback loop where we get some information from people, have a chance to elicit some information from people. So I think that relevance feedback, is pretty safe to say, is probably the first interactive technique in IR. It's what made IR interactive. Um, a lot of people today, in fact, even will argue that relevance feedback is not really good interaction. That, you know, because now we think about interaction, we think of a whole lot of other different kinds of things. But I think at, at its core, it probably was the first there. Um, I mentioned before it originally was developed to help people arrive at the ideal query. So again, we're thinking about single sessions where people are sitting down and trying to find information about something. And the idea was that this, this technique was going to help them refine their query, not, not thinking about profiling long-term stuff, just as short-term stuff. Um, the nice thing about it is that it operates on recognition instead of recall. So there's a lot of work in IR that says, you know, people often, they don't quite know what they're looking for. Otherwise, they wouldn't be searching. Right? If you already know it, then why bother to search for it? Um, there are, of course, some exceptions to that. But in general, the idea of people trying to formulate a query is really odd, because how are you supposed to reduce what you don't know uh, into something that's supposed to be understandable by the system? Um, and so the idea of relevant feedback was that, well, people may not be able to actually articulate what they want to know or what they don't know, but they may be good at recognizing it. And we know that this is sort of a principle that works in everyday life. We can recognize when something is good, but we may not necessarily be able to recall it from memory. So it's a good thing that, in that it works this way from the user's perspective. Now, I want to, I guess, stop here for a second to let you know that if you want to interrupt me and ask me questions, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. So if you feel like asking, you can ask. Um, but here are the two types of relevance feedback that I want to tell you about. These are the, the two major types that people have looked at and researched. Uh, explicit feedback, which is something that the user actively engages in. It's sort of an activity in and of to itself. And the other kind is implicit feedback. And this is a stuff that I think is more popular these days, where you're actually trying to mine signals from the person's natural interactions with the system. So the user's not doing anything extra. The user doesn't even know they're engaging in feedback. It's just something that's there as part of their normal behavior. So um, that, that's something uh, that I'll, I'll tell you, sort of, we'll sort of dive into that um, at the end. And I'll also sort of let you know of some problems, I think, with, with using that, or some challenges. Challenges, I think, is a better way to say it. So um, when you think about explicit relevance feedback, you can think about it in a couple of different ways. But the major way that it's been used is term relevance feedback. So term relevance feedback is, for instance, a system suggesting some terms to a person that says, hey, maybe you want to add some of these terms to your query. That's sort of the most basic way to think about it. But you can also think about it happening at the document level. So here is where a user says, I like that document. And you can imagine each one of these kind of techniques has their own sets of problems with respect to, well, how do we use the information if the person's making a judgment at the document level? How do we decide what terms to show people? So they all have their, they have their own unique problems. Uh, and we'll look at some of those. Um, I want to just show you a couple of different examples because, interestingly, feedback is available now everywhere on systems. Most systems, most services cannot resist eliciting just a little bit of feedback from people about something. So this is what's term, this is term relevance feedback. And this is just an example of, of something from a study that, that uh, we did. And this is just to show you sort of what happens with typical term relevance feedback. You know, a person's like clicking and saying, 
add these terms to my query. This is some other kinds of feedback. I just thought that those were funny uh, because you know you can rate items and recommender systems and things like that. So that's also a, a kind of feedback that's available. Let's see. Here's another kind of uh, feedback example. Uh, this was from another study that we did, or actually one I'll, I'll tell you about in just a second. But uh, here you can have terms, and then you can have little example sentences from where these terms um, came from. So this is another way that you could get feedback from people. And then one more shot, which is a, a very old system that I did some research on, but it shows a couple of other ways of getting feedback. Uh, this is very busy, I know, but the, the reason I want to show you this is that you can see here in a list of search results, you have good and bad documents. So this actually has bad negative feedback, which I'll say something about a little later, which is very hard. Uh, and then here, when you click on good, terms from that document are extracted and then populated in this window. And then the person could actually take one of these terms and add it to their query if they wanted. Same thing with negative. These are terms extracted from this document that's been marked negative. And a person could take these terms and add them to the query in sort of a negative way, saying that I don't want this term. It's not a good term uh, to use. So I'm just did not have a good, sorry, didn't have a good back button for that. But um, what people have found, uh, system-centered research, and so when I say system-centered research, I mean research that you know, knows that there's a user out there somewhere but doesn't actually study the person making the relevance judgments, just studies the, the operations of producing the terms, using the terms, and things like that. Um, System-centered research has found that relevance feedback works. In fact, relevance feedback is probably one of the, the successes in classic IR. And most people believe in these classic IR model that uh, more is better. More terms are better. Now, in web searching, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, but in, these kind, in this kind of research, that was the general idea. And it was because of the way the systems worked. Uh, you know, a, a longer query would lead to usually higher precision. Uh, in, in general, better results. So when you do relevance feedback, you're making the query longer. That usually worked out well. There's something called pseudo-relevance feedback as well. So this is relevance feedback where you, as a system developer, assume that the top 10 documents that you've returned for a user are relevant. You just assume right away they're relevant. You take terms from those documents. You use those to expand the query and then you give the user some results. So the user actually never sees the first iteration of results because as a developer, you take that as data, as feedback, to build a bigger query than to return some new results. So there's this idea of pseudo-relevance feedback as well, uh, which people generally believe works pretty well. So the user-centered research, so this is a research that actually studies people trying to do these kind of things, use these, these uh, term, you know, provide term relevance feedback and stuff like that, has sort of had mixed results. Um, and I'll sort of dive in now into some of the, the system issues and the user issues, in particular um, issues related to whether I know what some of you are thinking, which is, would people actually do that? Who's going to sit around and, you know, pick terms to add to their queries? Is this something that's even feasible to do. Um, so we'll look at that in just a second. But here are some of the big issues if you're going to try to use relevance feedback uh, that people have found and sort of studied uh, that, that are really sort of system, I, I call these system problems or system issues. Um, first is actually how do you use this feedback that people provide to you? What do you do? There's an infinite number of ways of using this stuff. And I think down at some point I talk about this as a, a sort of lots of parameters. That's the big issue here. So how do you use this feedback that people provide? Do you do waiting? Do you re-wait? Do you say the terms, you know, do you add the terms to the query? Do you go out and get new terms? Um, if your people are providing relevance feedback at the document level, how do you use that? How do you extract information from those documents? So how do you use this? 
Um, another big issue is actually populating, if you're interacting with people, populating those interfaces I showed you. So I showed you a bunch of terms. Well, where do those terms come from? How do you get those terms? So that's another big problem. And this is one reason why, again, the whole area of relevance feedback is actually really hard because it's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening and a whole bunch of stuff that has to be going just right in order for you to, for instance, even test whether people are going to want to use a relevance feedback interface. You got to get all this stuff right. If the terms you suggest to people are awful, then no, no one's going to pick any of them. Uh, so you know, there's a, a lot of issues with respect to that. I listed some of the different parameters you have to deal with if you're trying to use relevance feedback or implement it. So there's ranking. So again, how do you just re-rank documents based on feedback? Do you show people a document that they've already seen, that a person has already said is relevant? How do you, what do you do with that? Um, weighting, again, how do you weight the terms? How do you weight the terms that the user adds to their query automatically? How do you weight the terms that you might extract from documents as a developer to add to the query? Um, there's issues with how many documents do you use for feedback. So if you're doing pseudo-relevance feedback, do you take the top 10 documents and then extract the top 20 terms from those? Or do you take the top 20 documents and extract the top five terms from those? So there's all these different parameters that people have spent a lot of time trying to fine tune. And you know, I wish I could tell you that there was some really great rule, but the research seems to suggest that there's a lot of sort of heuristic development going on, so just trying different uh, adjustments on the parameters and seeing what happens. Um, it's also the case that the, the parameter values are dependent on the document corpus, so actually what the documents look like to begin with. So again, lots of stuff you have to deal with if you want to do this in, um, in practice. Um, and then, you know, uh, how much feedback do you provide to people, or how much p feedback do you elicit from people, uh, and then how do you combine the, these new representations with the old representations? Mm -hmm. Fairly complicated to figure out what to do, but are there any general rules about what does and does not work? Any general principles that have come from all the research that says this generally does work, this does not work, you should always consider doing this, anything like that? Um, I'm going to say, although. I can't, th I can't think of any rule right off the bat except that people generally have thought in classic IR that relevance feedback works, period, pretty much any kind of it. Now, if you add a bunch of terrible terms, of course, that's not going to work. But people generally believe that it's a good thing to do. People generally believe that it's longer queries are going to increase retrieval. And so that was sort of the target goal in this classic IR was to try to get a bigger query from people. Um, but in terms of these parameter settings, I, none really pop out of my head. They all seem to be like, here's what you need to use in this particular situation. Here's what you can use in this other situation. And I will say that, I, you know, I don't know everybody in here, but certainly David, who introduced me, is actually a, an expert uh, in relevance feedback. And so he may be able to sort of, um, you know, give you some more rules about it than I'm, I'm able to right off the bat. But I think in general that a lot of it has to do with particular situations, uh, context, collections, search tasks, and things like that. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, fair, that's, that's fair to say. Okay. I, mean, I think some of the general observations are. In general, you don't need a lot of relevance feedback in order to make a difference. So even knowing one relevant document or two can make a big difference to you, to, to the search, to the, to the mm -hmm. way the query's pushed. Mm -hmm. um, I think as well on the pseudo-relevance feedback, again, it can be very damaging to search. So um, when it works well, it works really well, but it can, it can be very damaging. So again, the general <coughs> rule would be not to go too far down when you're doing pseudo-relevance feedback, maybe feedback <coughs> one, two, three, a small number of documents, assume those to be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, in, in web retrieval, where in some of the ranking, we're looking at an and type um, um, situation, um, you have to be very careful about how many more terms you add in. So that's, that's another issue that comes about. Yeah, and that's really worth pointing out another distinction between a lot of this research is developed in a probabilistic framework. It's not using these hard 
uh, classic ANDs. Uh, so that changes the, the sort of, that changes, I think, an ability to say this is a rule that you might try. It's more a matter of here are some things that have been done, and, and this might give you some ideas, but probably you're going to have to do some adaptation just because your situation is, is a lot different than when a lot of these studies were done and different than the collections and the topics and things. Mm -hmm. You haven't said anything yet about what, what you consider to, how you measure better. Because are you going to say something about that? Because, I mean, the, the whole thing is that you're, you're saying relevance feedback is, is better, but how do you measure that? And does it, does it change depending on whether you've got somebody who's an expert in this field versus somebody who's not? Um, so <clears throat> I'm not going to, so in these kind of models, um, I, t I talked with Carrie a little bit about this, uh, about how sort of evaluation is done in traditional IR, which is usually with a closed collection that has a corpus, typically newswire, some topics, typically 50 in number, and then some relevance judgments. So people have made some relevance judgments. And so that's probably similar maybe to some of your evaluation scenarios, except some, some small differences. And so typically what's used as a measure of better, especially in system-centered research, is are measures like average precision, um, discounted cumulative gain uh, is another one. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into, I'll be glad to talk, in fact, I would love to have a conversation about the evaluation measures, but I'm not going to present those here because it's a sort of a, a different, different thing. But that's typically how these things are evaluated. And that's actually a problem here is that it's really hard to evaluate relevance feedback and the benefits of it because things change. It's an iterative process. And so you have time one where there's no relevance feedback. You have those search results. Then you have time two where you've got some relevance feedback. And so how do you actually compare the impact of those results or impact of that relevance feedback? How do you isolate the effects of just adding those new terms that you added, for instance? Um, and then the other issue is with relevance feedback, of course, you don't want to give people the same document over and over and over again. If a person has said, this document is relevant, well, that's great, but they don't want to keep seeing it over and over and over again. They've already seen it. And if you're trying to do evaluation, do you just keep counting it over and over and over again? Or do you try to you know, include some kind of measure of diversity or how much the thing has how much the list has changed? So it's actually a really hard problem here is to evaluate and, and the, the actual impact of this. Um, there's a, a really nice model by Ian Campbell and uh, Keith Van Riceberg, and they did some work on this ostensive relevance. Um, and so in, in their model, that they've, there's, a, there's even an interface there for, for browsing in this way. But in their evaluation scenario, there is actually a decay function. So the documents that a person marks relevant at a particular time, a snapshot, those documents are considered to be the most relevant at that particular point. If a person had marked something relevant at the beginning of the interaction and it shows up again later at this particular point, maybe later in the list, then those don't get quite as much value or their, their value is diminished a little bit because the per person's already seen them. Um, and then the, all, the other idea is that a person's need is changing. As they keep seeing new documents, they're learning about what their interests are and they're changing what really is relevant. Um, so there's a, that kind of function in there as well. <clears throat> so the other big issue here is that the effectiveness of this depends on the initial query. So if the person's initial query is crap, then if you do pseudo-relevance feedback on results returned from that query, it's unlikely that that's really going to help, right? So a lot of this is dependent on how good that first query is if you're using it to generate terms to retrieve documents. And so that's a big, a big issue. And then actually David did some work um, and talked about this idea of query drift, which as you go through these iterations of refining, 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 there's this danger that the person's topic is actually really going to start to change. The query is going to change, not from the person's point of view, but just because you're adding more and more terms to it. And so it suddenly becomes a totally different uh, thing than what the person initially started with. So that's another uh, a, a problem. These are all, again, problems or challenges or things to think about. And then I just alluded to this here as well, is that the person's need is changing over time as a person interacts, finds more documents. What they want is changing, and so it's really hard to incorporate that into the query in some kind of way. Uh, 
Um, so here are some user issues, and again, this is like summarizing a bunch of research and, and, and trying to present you all with some uh, bottom line stuff, although uh, sometimes it's hard to do this. But one hard part of them is that um, terms, especially on these just term interfaces where it's like here's a bunch of terms, these things are not presented in context. So a person really has no idea what this term means. You're just presented with a bunch of terms. You have no idea if this term is being used in the way that you think it's being used or that you're trying to use it. So a lot of times, you know, research has found that, well, this may be, th this may be a problem for people, people understanding and, and not, not understanding what these terms are that they're picking and what they mean in these particular different contexts. Um, <clears throat> the quality of terms also can impact uh, the interaction you have with the user. So if you actually want to engage a person in relevance feedback and you start off and you generate a bunch of awful terms, the person is going to look at that and make some judgment about the quality of that feature. And so it's really this dangerous game you're playing because you can uh, you know, turn people off right away and they'll say, well, I'm, I don't trust that. I don't recognize any of those terms. I have no idea what that system is doing. So you can actually, uh, that, that those terms can actually impact a person's willingness to do this, to engage in this kind of activity. The other uh, two things here are kind of related. People have said, well, people don't do relevance feedback or people don't want to participate in relevance feedback because it's just too cognitively demanding. Like, people are already engaged in the searching tasks. They've got all kind of other things going on. They don't have time to sit there and, you know, add terms to their documents. The other issue here has to do with, uh, go ahead. Is it that users don't have time to do that, or do they actually engage with you? Well, so th this has been an explanation for why people may not engage in this. So. A person may do a study and find that nobody's engaging in their, rele their experimental relevance feedback feature, and they may explain this by saying, well, people are using this experimental IR system, and so they just aren't able to concentrate on finding and marking relevant documents and you know, doing this query refinement process all at the same time. So that's more of an explanation for why. And again, a lot of these are explanations af after the fact, after people have done research about why people may or may not be participating in relevance feedback. So again, depending on what the person is doing, they just may not have time. Not time as in, I'm busy, I need to hurry up and finish this, but they might not have the cognitive resources to engage in something else. They may just be able to only focus those things on the task at hand. Uh, so does that answer your question? OK. <clears throat> this idea of control has to do with how much control you give the person. So do you let the person actually pick the terms? Do you show the person how the terms are generated? You know, how much do you communicate to the user about what's going on and about how their terms are going to be used versus just doing things magically, right? So that's, that's this, this issue that people have addressed in these kind of studies. And again, you know, it's, it's unclear. Some people have found that, you know, there's sort of a, an optimal mix of control and magic that people want. Um, other people have, have said that, you know, no, people, people just want the system to do good things for them. So the, the next one, I guess, is my, always my favorite one, which is that, you know, people are just too lazy to provide feedback. So why bother, especially in web searching, why bother to provide feedback and refine your query when you can, you know, type in a query, check out the results, you might see some good words, refine your query. Like, it's just too burdensome to actually do this. Um, so this is a, a reason that people, uh, again, sort of a barrier if you wanted to use relevance feedback, something you need to think about, that you know, this is uh, something that might, might be happening. Um, the other thing here is that maybe people just aren't able to pick the best terms. So there's been a really nice study by Ian Ruthven, which said, you know, OK, if people could pick the optimal terms, then it would help a lot. But people are not able to look at terms, a set of terms, and say, that's going to be a good term. And the idea here is that, well, the machine actually has access to lots of statistical information about term co-occurrence, term frequency, what search terms people have used in the past, and things like that. Uh, one individual human being is not going to have access to that. So this has to do with whether a person actually is in a position to determine what's going to be the most effective terms to add to their query, given a list. Mm -hmm. To expand on that, 
if the machine already has all the statistics and you only present the ones that the machine believes are useful, then whatever the user picks has got to be better now. So I mean, you don't present things which you believe are going to be going to be bad. Yeah, based on whatever statistics you have. Yeah, so what a lot of this research has found is that even if you, if you took a term and you measured its goodness based on some statistic that the machine had available to it to, to identify its goodness, even then people will not pick these terms. So I, I understand your point that, okay, let's say only present five really, really, really outstanding ones, and then if a person picks one, then it's going to be presumably good from the system point of view. But these kind of studies have looked at all the terms that have been uh, presented and and have just found that people are not able to go in and pick, people and systems do not agree on what are the good terms. Um, and so that's what this stuff has found. And again, if a system were existed that could pick five really awesome terms, then why even bother to show them to the user to begin with? Like, why not just use them? Uh, so there is, this, there is this idea that there has to be some sort of, not filtering by the user, but it's, you know, here's the system presenting its evidence, here's the user using its intelligence to, you know, add on to that evidence. And the, the studies here have, have sort of questioned whether the user is in a position, has the, not, in, well, I guess, has the intelligence to be able to go in and pick out what term is going to work best. Because this, the person doesn't know what documents are out there, they don't know the distribution of language and terms and documents and things like that. Uh, and then the last thing here I think that people have discussed a lot has to do with the sustainability of explicit feedback for long-term modeling. So if you're doing, having a system, a lot of the stuff I've been talking about has sort of been one-off where a person has a query and you're trying to do something for that per person in this particular session and time. But you can also think about using relevance feedback as a way of eliciting feedback from a person over a long period of time in order to build some sort of model or profile of that person's interest. So again, a lot of the examples I've been giving you have been like in a single session where a person has one query or two queries, but it doesn't have to be used in that way. It can be used over a longer period of time. And so there's been a lot of questioning about, okay, well, explicit feedback, even if it does work, can we expect that this is a way that would sustain a, an evolving model of a person's interest? Is a person going to periodically you know, pick out terms and, and pick out relevant documents in enough frequency to allow a system to gather information that can be used in a long-term way and can do it so that that information is updated when it needs to be updated? Oh, yes. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm looking at the time, uh, and I see I probably did not time this best. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump ahead. I had an example of some research we did in this field in explicit feedback. But I'm going to jump ahead and tell you about implicit feedback and tell you about a pro one project that I did there, because I think that's probably um, uh, a little bit more interesting. Uh, so if you'll just excuse me while I go through here very quickly. I'm not going to say, again, I apologize for this, but I just um, did not do the timing very well. You saw the slide about negative relevance feedback, and I'll say something about that at the end, because that's actually an outstanding challenge, is actually how do you incorporate negative feedback? It's a really hard problem because, one, it's not clear what people mean when they say that I don't want any more like this. So if you're, especially if you're talking about a unit like a document, what is it about that document that the person doesn't like? or that makes it not relevant. It's hard for the system to also implement some sort of negative function. So what does that look like? And it can be really dangerous, because you might uh, run the risk of eliminating a lot of really good stuff. So the negative feedback stuff, I think, is uh, something that's sort of low-hanging fruit. It's a really hard problem, but certainly something that people really haven't got a good handle on. And users, in the studies that I've done, they, they're, they're really scared of negative relevance feedback because they, they're not sure what's going to happen when they say, I don't want any more like this. They don't understand what that's going to do. And there's actually been a study where a person looked at negative relevance feedback as it's been implemented in several classic retrieval models and found that it behaves very differently. It's not predictable what that relevance feedback will actually do to a term or query uh, if you include it. So uh, there's a, a lot of stuff there uh, that hasn't been fully examined, I think. So to kind of go ahead to implicit feedback, uh, this is, again, using behaviors 
that a person exhibits while they search as feedback of what a person's interests are. And it's really nice because if you think about a person doing searching, especially on the web, they generate lots of data. And there's a whole bunch of pages that they view. And the you know, very nice thing to think about is within that large set of pages that any particular human being looks at, the pages that they like are in there somewhere, right? So your problem is to try to figure out which of those pages in an entire stream are the ones that that person likes the most. And again, to use that information to potentially create some sort of long-term model of that person's interest or even to do something with retrieval in a particular instance in time. So these are some examples of things that have been used and investigated as implicit feedback. Now, a lot of the stuff, I put select and bold here because this is you know, your classic click-through. And this has been investigated the most. And as you may or probably all know, uh, it's used a lot. It's pretty common practice now to use this uh, in lots of different web applications. Uh, so this is, again, looking at what a person clicks on and using that as a signal for relevance. So click equals relevance in some kind of way. Uh, people have also looked at uh, view, uh, so if a person, how long a person actually views something, so that should actually say view time there, uh, how long a document's displayed in a browser. Uh, listen, so if you're talking about an audio um, uh, scenario, how long a person chooses to listen to a particular thing. People have looked at scrolling as well as finding, so you can do find within a page, as all of these things as potential sources of evidence for what a person's interests are and what a person knows. Uh, there's a few more here, and I uh, just call these retention behaviors. Uh, and then these two down here really are more about a person's sort of production behaviors, I will say. These are things that may not really happen as part of an interaction with a search engine or even in a browser, but these are production activities that if you had that information available to you and you were trying to design a search system, that kind of information might help you uh, understand, again, more about what that person's interests are. So this, I think, is um, why it's really important is because it's, it's all there. And the person's interests are in that, in that you know, gigantic mess of um, page views. And you know, your job is to figure out what are the good things. The other good thing about it is, again, there's this idea of whether explicit relevance feedback is actually feasible, i.e., will people do it, do it consistently, even can they do it? And then this idea of sustainability, if you're looking at long-term modeling, is this any way to sustain a model over time? And so implicit feedback sort of you know, says, well, here's some good stuff uh, that we may be able to use. It's usually thought to be a little bit weaker, uh, but it's available in larger quantity. Uh, and in general, a lot of it's somewhat easy to access, especially if you work for a search engine company. Uh, you can see at least a little bit of what a person is doing with respect to click-through anyway. Uh, so what do we know about it in general? This may not be a surprise to anybody, but uh, click-through is usually a pretty good signal of a person's interest. Uh, and people have used that with a lot of success. And it's not always the case, and there's lots of caveats to this, which I'll tell you about, but just as sort of a, a lump average talk about this, this statement I think is fair to make. Um, the other thing which is not here is that generally, if you're using display time, display times are really very low. So display time, web page display time is actually a positive skew. There's a whole bunch of stuff at the end, you know, around one second, two seconds, five seconds, and then there's a whole, is a very long tail that describes how long people uh, display web pages. So that's another general finding, uh, which again is, is probably somewhat intuitive. A lot of studies have also found that there's a positive relationship between display time and relevance. Uh, again, there's some caveats to that, which I'll, I'll tell you about in a little while. Uh, but if you look at it overall, a lot of times people have found this relationship exists. So some of the big issues with this is that a lot of studies that have looked at this behavior have been based on what I consider incomplete data. So for instance, you can imagine what kind of data, if you were actually trying to look at display time, and you were only looking at display time, and you only could look at it from a server perspective, what kind of display time data you would get. If you looked at it from a client perspective, if you're actually computing this metric based on client, you could think about what kind of measure you would get. 
They're two very, they're different measures. Um, so a lot of times it's incomplete data, or it's just not, not everything that the person is actually doing in a particular moment. It's just some stuff that you can get that's available at one particular location or the other. Um, the other thing about it is that it's usually general. And so we know how science works, and this is a really nice thing about science, is that you know, we often, looking at big data sets, we take the average and we say, oh, here's some summary information, and this is what people on, in general are doing. And this is really great. Uh, but if you're trying to personalize retrieval to individuals, basing your rules for doing the personalization on what everybody does seems a little off. Uh, so, you know, the idea here is like, why not just look at what a particular individual is doing instead of just lumping everybody together? Because we know people are different. Uh, the other big problem is that a lot of this research hasn't considered contextual variables. Uh, so things like task and a person's familiarity with the topic. So these things have been shown to potentially affect the rate at which people display pages, click-through behavior, display time, whether a person prints or saves. And so when people are doing searching, they're all, you don't really know what they're doing. And a lot of this data that you get just at a server is out of context. It's a whole bunch of signals. And again, there's not much context for what's really going on and what that person is trying to accomplish. So that's been another big issue. And uh, in fact, well, I know Melanie is here, and she's studied some of this uh, stuff as well. Uh, so it's a another great resource, I think, internally for you if you wanted to look a little bit more into this idea of task, changing people's behaviors. So the study I'm going to tell you about, what I wanted to do was to look from the person's perspective wanted to gather data from that person's, from the person's client machine, look at what they were doing over a long period of time, and try to figure out if these contextual variables, like what a person was trying to accomplish, uh, how much a person knew about a particular topic, how much a person searched for a particular topic, if these kind of things impacted the one's ability to use behavior as signals, behavior that's out of context as signals. So what are some things to be thinking about? Um, if you're trying to use this behavior. Um, so the other thing I wanted to do in the study was to try to develop a method to study this, because it's a really hard, hard thing to study. So what I did in this study, uh, and again, this is going to be a, a, a real quick summary of a very complex study that lasted a long time and consumed many hours of my life, uh, but there it is. Uh, what I did was I did a small study with seven people uh, and what I, I did was I studied them for about 14 weeks. And when I did this study, I did this study a few years ago, uh, what I did was I gave people laptop computers to use. And these were new laptops. And so this was sort of the way that I enticed people to participate in this study. And I said, hey, if you're willing to participate in this study for 14 weeks, if you're willing to let me log every single thing that you do on the client, so this means all email, this means all word processing, all interactions over the web, every single thing that you do for 14 weeks. And if you're willing to come in, meet with me once a week, and give me some information, some feedback, then you can keep this computer. So that worked pretty well. <laughs> and if you're worried about ethical issues, I should point out, I, I'm actually I'm a person who's very concerned. I can, another thing I could talk about forever about research ethics. I'm actually on my university's institutional review board, so you know there was some, some working out of those issues. But uh, uh, anyway, so it was all, all OK from that perspective. Uh, so as you can imagine, I did not have a, you know, no dropout rate here. There's a, a term called experimental, experimental mortality. That's the, that's the real term for when people drop out of studies. I actually used that term once in a paper, and a reviewer wrote, did they die? I said, no, but, but it's a real life term. So this is a, a diagram of the data that I collected, just so you get an idea. For every document that a person viewed, this is a web document here, I had some set of behaviors that I looked at. And I had a whole bunch of other behaviors, but these were the ones I picked out to look at. I had display time, whether they printed or saved it. I had a relevance judgment for every one of these documents. So for some people, during this 14-week period, they made relevance judgments on like thousands of documents. They did this at weekly intervals, so it wasn't too much work for them. And then I collected what I consider to be context. So for every document that a person viewed, I had them create 
customized list of tasks and topics. So the person told me what they were trying to do. I'm trying to find references for a paper. I'm trying to plan travel. So they actually classified all the documents that they viewed into these task categories that they created themselves. Same thing with topics. So they'd say, this document is about traveling to Bermuda, or this document is about um, running a race in Richmond, for instance. And then for each one of these things, I collected some information to characterize them. So endurance and persistence are sort of the same, and that's how long a person expects to be interested or doing a task or be interested in a topic. So this sort of gets, you know, is this something that they're interested in for a long period of time, or is this one of these one-off things where they just happen to be looking for some, you know, they saw something on TV and just wanted to check. Um, frequency for task was how often a person actually engaged in a particular task. So do you do it every day, once a week, once a month? Uh, and then stage. So this had to do with if it was a task that could be characterized in this way, were you almost finished or were you just starting? So I wanted to look at how all of that stuff actually affected the ability to go from this to this. So again, is it a one-to-one -one correspondence or does all of this stuff really affect your ability to use that? for instance, as a signal. So this just gives you a quick diagram of the, of the sort of the study, what was going on. Um, the whole time I had client logger going on. I also had a server log, a proxy. Their searching was going through a proxy so that I could gather a little collection of things that they viewed during this 14-week period. Uh, the, ethic, the legal issues with that, I'm not going to say anything about because I don't know what they are. But uh, anyway, I collected these little mini collections for every person. Now, the context evaluation at this day one, when people came in, I gave them their laptops, they sort of told me what they expected to be doing. So I sort of got some baseline information about that. Each week of the study, they would come in and meet with me for one week, and they would update their task. They might say, oh, I'm, I'm doing this new task this week, or that task I'm finished with. So they might provide me some information like that. They also sat down and evaluated a set of documents that they had viewed during that week. So they would rate the document's usefulness. So this is how I got, gathered this kind of a baseline judgments. And so this went on for 14 weeks. Um, and as you can imagine, I collected lots of data. Well, this shows you the evaluation interface. So when the person came in, the pages that they had viewed during the week would show up here. There's a scrollable list of tasks and topics a person could click on to associate with this particular document. Then a person could rate whether something was useful um, for, from a content perspective or from a navigation perspective. And what that means is that if a person said, well, the document helped me get somewhere, not because there's anything specific on there other than a hyperlink. Um, that's why something would be navigationally useful. So it's a more a matter of uh, assistance with getting somewhere else that's even more important than the document itself. Uh, and then people indicated how confident they were in their evaluations. Mm -hmm. um, so the Right, so that's, that's, a, a, that's a, a really great observation for this day and time. And, and when I did this study five or six years ago, that would have helped me out uh, then. But as it turns out, it's one thing I wanted to say something about. Uh, the question has to do with whether this is really usefulness and how do you separate that from entertainment. Uh, the fact of the matter is, in the end of the study, people do use the web a lot for entertainment. And again, that's sort of this issue is separating those instances where a person is just looking because they want to find a YouTube video that shows somebody doing something stupid uh, versus you know, trying to find a paper that's going to help them write a SIG IR article or something. And that's, that's sort of the crux of this whole entire study, which is if you're just observing signals, you have no idea really what a person is doing, then how it, it makes it really difficult to use these signals effectively. Uh, and, and again, what, that's what needs to be done as sort of the, the next research challenges is trying to figure out how to distinguish among these different types of things people are trying to do. Because a lot of stuff is entertainment. It really is. Mm -hmm. 
But it seems to me that, that that's a differentiation between classic IR versus web-based IR. In other words, it's not, both are useful. It's, it's more likely that somebody that's looking for entertainment will be looking for a, a particular thing versus a, a variety of things as compared to someone who's looking for research work. Yeah, so that's, again, that's part of, part of all of this, which is that there are these, these two, we could talk about high precision or, you know, entertainment task or something, and then this other kind of thing that people are doing. But, you know, we know that people more and more are probably doing these exploratory searches, these high recall searches, probably are starting to look, go to the web more and more to do these things. So the issue is, in a world where we see more of a mix then what can we do? I mean, right now, I agree with you, yeah. And this is, I mean, this, you know, web searching has changed people's view of evaluation measures, of what their conceptions of about what people are doing and what IR is for. Um, it's changed it dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years and changed research, published research, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, it's had a huge impact. And so th that, that is, that's a really, that's, that's part of it. between web-based IR and classic IR is a problem that I run into at this company because I'm a technical writer here trying to help people find information about stuff within Google. That's much more of a classic IR sort of thing. This company, though, is based on web IR attitudes towards searching. Mm -hmm. And so we, get a, we, we tend to, to run into that problem a lot. So it sounds like maybe what you do is a little bit more like enterprise is that well, you know, I mean, even our, I don't know a lot about our enterprise stuff, but I think that, that what we run into is the difference between what I would call technical information gathering versus web-based gathering, which is unpredictable by the mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's hard. And again, that's why it's really hard to, to try to use and apply stuff that's been developed in other domains and figure out what's, when can you say this is a good rule and when, can, when is it not? And, and, and also just having conversations with people and, and making sure that everybody understands what's in everybody's mind when they're talking about searching. Mm -hmm. This is, I take it, your UI for asking people the relevance of the page that they visited, right? Mm -hmm. So a couple quick questions. The tasks and topics, were those generated by the subjects or by you in observation, or where did they come from? The subjects generated them, them themselves. So these are, are sort of They're their own tasks. And yeah, okay. yeah. Was this evaluation done at the moment or ex post facto, like a day later, or a week later, or something like that? This was done at weekly intervals. Okay. And so, uh, the, you know, there was, uh, people had no problem remembering what they were doing and remembering the pages. But I'm curious, though, if you've thought about the distinction between instantaneous relevance versus post hoc relevance. Because they could be very different things. Yeah, that, that's true. And that's, in fact, one thing that the question's about how I think how relevance changes over time is well, it, it, it could be exactly the same article exactly the same cast but after I read three other articles on this all of a sudden I realized that was the best one right yes right. and so, so now I changed my subjective evaluation with the relevance yes and this is a, a problem with getting relevance judgments from people and in fact again I somehow magically out of time here I, I don't know what I've done wrong but um, the one thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, we assume that a click equals relevance, but we make a lot of assumptions about what relevance really is. And what you're saying is, is something that people and I are just understand about relevance, that it changes over time, that it's relative. You know, you see one thing and then it's going to change the next. They're not independent judgments and all of these kind of things. And these are really hard problems. And if you're going to use, if you're going to talk about something being relevant, you really need to step back and think about what does that actually mean because it changes. Uh, Diane, why don't you give yourself another 10 minutes? Is everybody, I, as far as I know, the room's not been booked by anybody else. So okay. I'll just check off for sure, but just carry on as if you've got another 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. And again, if you need to leave and you want to ask me questions, you can, uh, I think my email is, is with the talk announcement. So. Uh, let me just show you uh, just a little sample of the data that I found, and then I want to kind of jump to the bottom line. Uh, again, uh, uh, I'll post all of these slides so you can go back and look through them if you want to see a little bit more about what, what I found. But this just gives you an idea of the amount of data that I collected for each person. Uh, 
these, this is the number of URLs requested. So just looking at a log, how many URLs I saw coming in there. Now some of that stuff is like you know a style sheet or an advertisement or stuff like that. So uh, some of that had to be filtered out. This is the number of pages that I actually got evaluations on. So I also had to make some decisions about what I was going to show people because clearly a person is not going to be able to sit down and evaluate 15,000 documents uh, even in 14 weeks. Uh, so this gives you an idea of that, and this gives you an idea about how many tasks and topics each person identified. And what you can see from this, and I think the important thing is that people are very different, right? And so again, this idea of trying to use what everybody does to make rules, especially for something like this, where you're doing something very personal for somebody, can be really dangerous because everybody is different. And so thinking about people as individuals, I think, is a, a really important thing to do. Um, let me just skip over to this slide. This is a really high bird's eye view. I know this is hard to look at, but I wanted to show you all of the display times here, and I did clean it a little bit at the end and cut it off. But you see most of the documents are being displayed for really short periods of time. This actually is one minute right here. So people make really quick decisions. They do it really fast. The other thing from this picture that I want to show you is that the distribution of documents that were rated is highly useful. So that's that light blue. It's on the bottom. It's right here. You can see this actually goes all along this line, or all along this uh, distribution. These scores actually are more variable. So if, again, if you're thinking about trying to create a rule like display time, you really need to think about the variability in this data, especially for things that are useful. For things that are not useful, there's not as much variability in the display times. They're a lot, lot tighter. I'm going to just now skip over uh, to show you another slide that's important, which this is for one subject. And this, is, this, day, this time has been uh, uh, put on a log base scale just to, again, compress. But what you see here is this is a different, the person's different task. This particular person, you see that display time varied greatly depending on what a person was trying to do. And again, this gets back to this idea of entertainment versus something like looking for movie reviews and schedules versus something like shopping and things like that. Reading the news, I always like is up there. Reading the news is usually actually pretty tight, too. Uh, there's not as much variability in that. So you can see how what a person is actually trying to do at any moment in time affects what this data looks like. Uh, so here are the sort of the major findings from this. Uh, in general, the display times were low. Uh, most usefulness ratings were really high. And there wasn't much printing and saving in this data. So you know, in terms of how much use you can get out of that, I don't know. And there was also no direct relationship between display time and usefulness. And so again, the take home message here is that there's a lot of stuff that's going on that you can't see that potentially impacts your ability to use these signals, to interpret these signals, and create rules and other sorts of techniques that use this, these signals as implicit feedback or feedback of what, what a person's interests are. The other thing I wanted to sort of say is uh, what this gentleman here sort of brought up, which is that relevance is sort of a moving concept. It's a moving target. We make lots of simplifying assumptions about what it means, but it's actually really complex. And you know, the assumption that one click equals something like relevance is really quite naive. And so there's a lot more going on there that a person could potentially take advantage of or their researcher could potentially examine and try to take advantage of in terms of coming up with a little bit more sophisticated understanding of what relevance actually means and what, what's going into those kind of judgments. But is there any correlation between the display time and the size of a document? Because some, some documents are small, right? It only takes five seconds to finish but it's still useful, but uh, some other documents are long. Yeah, so you can normal, the time here is not normalized because most things were just so short. You can normalize this, and some studies have normalized this. Ryan White did a study where he normalized display time according to the length of the document. And from my memory of that, it didn't really help that much. Uh, it didn't really add that much more information, so. Um, I'm gonna stop here, and again, I'm gonna, 
issue a, another apology for not quite uh, planning things uh, very well, but um, I do want to let you know that I'll post these slides and you can go through them. I'll post references if you want to read about any of this stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of it you're not going to be able to, it's not going to be off the shelf in terms of using directly in your research, but hopefully it'll give you ways of thinking about things in a different way uh, and maybe some pointers to some things that will help you solve some problems that you're working on. Um, I don't know, is this... They'll be on, they'll be on Twitch afterwards so with, with the video. The slides will be available then, or I can just email them right once that happens. Yeah. So I'll stop here, uh, and uh, again, I'll, I'll thank you all, and if, if anybody wants more questions, or wants to ask more questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer more of them. So thank you.